takes the emotion, then maybe there are. Right. That's, that's a very good point here about um, emotion and memory. We're, uh, like, like I said earlier just now, we're not going to focus too much on emotion and memory today. Dr. Knight knows way more about that, and she will probably cover that later. But yes, some studies suggest that if a piece of memory, episodic memory, has very strong emotional valence, it seems like people tend to remember them better than neutral memory. But I guess the idea here also is that a lot of these studies, the research findings, are based on neutral word lists. Now there are more studies actually, if people are really interested in emotion and memory and aging, they would probably use word lists. Even if they're using word lists, they would be using word lists that had a lot of um, emotion words. Just one thing that Dr. Knight has been doing, I think. But um, for a lot of these other standardized measures, it is it really doesn't have much to do with that, um, emotions. Excuse me. So um, at least based on what we're talking about in general today, that um, but yes, emotion is something. Oh, do you see a priming effect with elderly people such that just because they know that they're doing a cognitive task at the moment and they know that they're in the older group compared to the younger group that they're looking at, you know, that or they know that maybe you're looking at age-related differences, that simply knowing that you're older makes you experience memory deficits that you wouldn't otherwise, because I knew that on NPR they were talking about, so I didn't read the study, but on NPR they were talking about priming people and saying, you know, write down your age, or if they look at standardized tests between Asian Americans and Caucasian Americans, that if you ask them their race before they take a math exam, that Asian Americans would do better than if you don't ask. How about the rest of the class? Um, is anyone else familiar with the primary literature? Is this something you want? I'm actually going to cover a little bit of that oh, okay. later today, but that's also a very um, good point. It is related to memory. It is related to cognitive aging and just our performance in general. Um, but we sh I think we should go back to that later. About that. Okay. Um, so, I think I didn't really touch upon this thing here, the Perma Store. Is this something familiar to any of you? I was told that is a concept in gerontology. I was hoping that some of you would be able to help me out. Um, I think the idea is that, think of it as permanent storage. Perma Store. Um, I think that's why this word is formed. It wasn't a word. I don't think I saw it in the dictionary. No? Okay. <laughs> good, good. So I, I, I had an updated version of the dictionary, actually. Great. Now, think of it also as very, very long-term memory. Or um, if you're familiar with you know, different structures in the computer system, tertiary, uh, the third. Um, memory storage. So this is rather permanent. The idea is that if for some reason there is some information, there's some information very, very salient to you, whether it's word meaning, whether it's your personal experience and history, if it's so salient that you just can't forget it, then from the long-term memory it would get into the very, very, very long-term memory. And I think one idea is that if you happen to remember it even five years after it has happened, then you probably won't forget it. Make sense? Make sense? Some sense? Okay. So, um, once again, if you're looking at the entire model, what I want you to remember is that there's a lot of information going on. We have limited capacity to process everything. Even though most of it get passed down to the sensory memory, which is unlimited, huge, and also relatively unconscious, even though it happens there, we do need to have some form of attentional processes, working memory, some control over what else happens 
And then we need rehearsal, elaboration, different types of techniques to help it get down to long-term memory. So in a way, I guess the first two, the first three parts here you see, would be sort of like the encoding idea. You know what happens there? And then even rehearsal and elaboration. And then this is like storage. And by search processes, here we really are talking about retrieval. And so output would be what you're able to retrieve or remember. And once again, even if you don't remember something, it does not mean that it isn't here. It could be that your search processes are not functioning well. It could be that something was wrong even up there. So it makes it harder for you to encode. Uh, you, or maybe you encode part of it, not the entire thing. And that's why you only remember part of it. Which is great, because at least you remember what you encode, right? It's just that you only got half of it right from the <laughs> beginning. Shall we take a short break? This is a good time. This is a bathroom break. It's about um, 10 after 3. It's almost tea time. <laughs> If you want to go and get coffee, we might need more than five minutes. But, um, five to seven minutes, about that. Or come back. Okay. And we'll talk about why there might be those issues. And also the strategies that can help. If you have questions, you can come up where we can talk about those now. Or we can wait until the rest of the